What time tomorrow? Five o'clock downstairs. The quality that Where Joan had was an earthiness. It a wasn't an aloof-like <laughs> goddess, like a garbo. It might be the girl who's sitting next to you at the local movie show. It might be the girl who's working next to you on the assembly line is the part she often played. She was one of the people who were going to see her movies. People say, oh, she was lucky and she got in because of her looks and all the rest. What made her a star was I worked my buns off to get here and I'm not going to lose it. I think she felt because she crossed those railroad tracks that she was maybe a fraudulent, that she wasn't the real thing because she was acting and trying to act the grand dom. And I want to reassure her, Joan, you were the real thing. You certainly had some hard knocks and you made them all work for you. She learned from the experience of doing it and she learned by watching other people. I feel she developed more as an actress than almost anybody in the business with the exception of Marilyn Monroe. Joan was a woman who lived a dream. She became everything she dreamed about. But most of all, she became a star. Much has been written about Marilyn Monroe's childhood in this town. Joan Crawford's childhood would make Marilyn seem like Rebecca of Sunnybrook Farm. There's a lot of mystery surrounding uh, Joan's father. He disappeared quite early, never appeared again. So uh, the mother was charged with raising this girl and her brother. And she was not very responsible. I worked my way through St. Agnes Academy waiting on tables, and then I worked my way through um, Rockingham Academy from nine years of age to 13 waiting on tables. I never went beyond the sixth grade. That's one of my hang-ups. Her ambition was gargantuan. Uh, she saw the way to get out of the slums in going into show business. Uh, there wasn't much she could do. She couldn't sing very well. She wasn't even much of a dancer. That was the era of the Charleston, and everybody was doing it. And the more movement you made, the more vivacity you got into your performance, the more the audience loved it. She got a job in Chicago, uh, working in some little nightclub, and then some uh, producer saw her, and she went to New York and got a job in a Schubert musical in the chorus. I was never good enough to be in the first line of the chorus. The second line of the chorus of Innocent Eyes with Mr. Schubert and uh, Mr. Harry Rath spotted me, so I had uh, tests. And then they just sent me a wire saying, you know, put it under contract to Metro Goldwyn Mayer. This made her come to California. And uh, when she got off the train, there was no one there. She didn't know what to do, she didn't know who to call. And uh, finally a young man came up and he said, would you by any chance be Lucille LeSueur? And uh, she said, yes I am. And he said, oh well, he said, you know, this man never picks little girls like you. He usually gets tall, glamorous looking showgirls. When Joan arrived at MGM, it was already the giant among the Hollywood studios thanks to Irving Thalberg and Louis B. Mayer. They had a, a real factory going. They had more stars than there are in the heavens. That was their slogan. And they would take someone like Joan Crawford and give her dancing lessons, give her blessings in acting and in fencing and horseback riding. And she became a wapus baby star, which was the crowning glory for starlets in those days. 
In the beginning, they had uh, no one to do makeup or hair or uh, clothes or anything. I mean, the uh, people in her position at that time had to, to do the best they could. Her love was dancing. And she thought that uh, if she could get a picture dancing, that she could sell herself. And she used to go down to the Ambassador Hotel when they had uh, dances there. And naturally, being a terrific dancer, she uh, attracted the attention. She started just as a stock player. Sometimes you would only find her in the back of crowd scenes. One, she played Norma Shearer's back because Norma Shearer was playing a dual role as a good girl and bad girl. So in the, in the over-the-shoulder shots, it was Crawford's shoulder that was standing in for Norma's double. There were uh, several films which she probably made under the name of Lucille Lesseur. Uh, Louis B. Mayer, hey, it sounds like she's in a sewer. Yeah. <laughs> so we got to get a new name for her. They had a contest in a magazine, and uh, the first choice was Joan Arden. And a Joan Arden, an extra girl, sued Metro. So they took second choice, Joan Crawford. And I said, Woo! sounds like crawfish. And Billy Haynes, my best friend, said, better crawfish than cranberry. It's served with turkeys. I hope you never make one. She went to the makeup department, and they gave her a case of makeup. And she, it was just a trial and error thing with her until she finally arrived at a look that she thought was right. Her makeup developed from watching other people. She went through a series of different faces. She developed her eye makeup. She developed the mouth makeup. She created Joan Crawford, much like the name was also created. Slowly, she became a real actress and a real personality on the screen. There's something about stars. The camera falls in love with them, and that love is transmitted onto the silver screen. And uh, people fall in love with them, too. They can't take their eyes off them. As she progressed through the 20s, she finally got a role that made her very popular, which was Our Dancing Daughters. And it established the jazz baby type of role that Crawford was to play at that early stage in her career. What they showed on the screen was probably wilder and crazier than the reality was. But America wanted to see things in excess, and Joan Crawford was there to give it to them. They put her with uh, some of their very established players whose names were going to carry the picture. Lon Chaney, Charles Ray, John Gilbert, and these increased her box office value. And by the time she finally carried a picture herself, she was a marketable commodity. In those days, uh, to be a big success in Hollywood, you had to be invited to Pickfair, which was the home of Douglas Fairbanks and Mary Pickford. And uh, she was never invited there. But finally, uh, she went to see a play that Douglas Fairbanks Jr. was acting in and liked him very much, went backstage to congratulate him. And they started to see each other. And it was after she and Doug Fairbanks Jr. got married that she was eventually invited to Pickfair. And then Joan uh, went through a terrible period there. That night, they had a lot of guests in. They always had menus. It was very, very formal. And she said she never dared pick up a fork or a knife or anything that she didn't watch to see which one Mary picked up. And Doug Sr. Uh, thought this was very funny. He watched her one day. And so, as a joke, uh, when the fish course was served, he picked up a knife and used it, and she was sitting next to him. So she picked up a knife and used it also. And then afterwards she realized she was wrong. She saw Mary picked up a fork. <laughs> and so she said she was terribly embarrassed. Well, Doug Sr. thought that was very, very funny. I think the marriage to Doug Fairbanks Jr. was a romantic affair. Uh, they were both young, both starting out as actors. Uh, but there was an added uh, incentive in this liaison like you turn up, no. Like you be that low. Drop your head, 
got a feeling for you. Did you ever see somebody who She had come up from the slums of Kansas City, and uh, she was kind of ignored when she was first at MGM, and finally accepted as a star. So it was wonderful for her. In 1929, everybody panicked at Metro. But I mean everybody. Executives, actors, actresses. Starless didn't know enough, and I was a starlet. So I wasn't afraid. I did my first talkie, The Untamed, with Bob Montgomery, and I heard my voice, and I said, that's not me, that's a man. She studied the other stars, Garbo, Shearer, learned their tricks, learned how they knew where all the lights were and what good lighting was for them. When I first started in pictures, Adrian said, I've never seen such big shoulders. She should be the female Johnny Weissmuller. Adrian said, I can't cut her shoulders off, so I'll just exaggerate them. So that's how the padded shoulders came in which turned out to be a dress that she wore on the picture Letty Linton. When that picture was released, I think every, every manufacturer on 7th Avenue copied that dress. Joan was very ambitious. Louis B. Mayer was not particularly a pal of hers. She knew she would have to fight for roles. She went after them. She told me of, of one incident where she knew there was a script that she was interested in. She went in uh, to Louis B. Mayer's office when he wasn't there and nipped it, took it with her to the ladies' room, and stayed in the ladies' room reading this script and came out that character and walked into Louis B. Mayer's office and convinced him that she was that character, got the role. Grand Hotel was a great, great boost to Joan Crawford's morale. It was just a galaxy of stars, and she was one of them. There was John Barrymore, Lionel Barrymore, Greta Garbo, Louis Stone, Wally Berry, Gina Hershott. She only played a secretary, uh, so it was typecasting for her. She usually played the shop girl of the secretary in those years. She had no scenes with Garbo, and that was a great disappointment to her. But she palled around with Jack Barrymore, particularly. Was she playing something? Yes, the typewriter. Oh, you're a little stenographer. Yes, I'm a little stenographer. <laughs> That's fascinating. I don't suppose you'd uh, take some dictation from me sometime, would you? Well, uh, how about some tea, then? Tea would spoil my dinner. I only have one meal a day, and I'd rather hate to spoil it. She really became a major star out of that one film. She wanted to do Rain rather badly. It was the first established great role that she was to attack. The character of Sadie Thompson in Rain had already been played on stage by Jean Eagles and on screen by Gloria Swanson. So she had a lot to live up to when she did this role. I can speak to my earliest impressions as a little kid going to the Granada Theater in La Jolla, California, population then 4,000. Um, seeing Joan Crawford on the screen as I did, uh, to me, she was the ultimate uh, seductress. Now look here. <laughs> I want you to meet Thompson. Sadie, meet the boys. Boys. And this is Mr. Orne. Mr. Orne, your climate's blown. Sorry, Sadie, it's the best we got. Oh, I'm not blaming you. Say, what's this about the delay? How long am I booked for this bird, you know? Well, I recall seeing her seducing Reverend Davidson, played by Walter Houston. And if the lady could seduce Reverend Davidson, that was something. Innocent or guilty, you have got to serve your sentence. It's the only way you can prove you are worthy of mercy. Oh, no, Mr. Davidson. Your God and me could never be shipmates. And the next time you talk to him, you can tell him this for me, that Sadie Thompson is on her way to hell. Stop! This has gone far enough. Oh, no, it hasn't gone far enough. 
You've been telling me what's wrong with me. Now I'm going to tell you what's wrong with you. You keep yelling at me to be punished, to go back and suffer. How do you know what I've suffered? You don't know, you don't care, and you don't even ask, and you call yourself a Christian. Oh, well, you're nothing but a miserable witch bird, if that's what you are. Name. You believe in torture. Thy kingdom come. You know you're big, and you know you're strong, and you've got the law on your side, and the power to hang me. All right. But I've got the power to stand here and say, you hang me and be damned to you. You better? She started getting into important roles, especially with Clark Gable. Well, what do you know about that? He can actually smile. This combination of this manliness of Gable and this quirky, uh, independent, bright, electric young woman uh, just made magic on the screen. Takes years and years of hard work. No, I'm not afraid of work. Takes guts and brains. Yeah, I know. And after you've given everything, maybe something will come of it. Maybe nothing. Something's got to come of it. Well, I suppose if you feel you got it, you got it. Yeah. You like to dance? More than anything in the world. You want to work with me? Yes, Mr. Gibson. Jay. Yes, sir. Now beat it. Thank you. Even if I loved you so much, it was killing me. And I knew you'd haunt me for the rest of my life. I still wouldn't have any part of you. I only hope they take you back to that prison you belong in. Well, I think the success of uh, Gable and Crawford was that they were equals. Supposing I was the guy you were dumb enough to fall for. Then what? Here's what. They made, uh, oh, eight or ten pictures together, and, and nearly all of them were hits. He was a king wherever he went. He earned the title. He walked like one, he behaved like one, and he was the most masculine male I have ever met in my life. She and Clark had a love affair that lasted for years and years and years. Uh, but she told me she was madly in love with the man. Uh, but she told me that she realized that the marriage would never last. She had divorced uh, Douglas Fairbanks. And uh, it was a very sad situation for her. Well, you double-crossed me, Janie. You're a success. You're marvelous. Her Please next marriage was to a very good actor and a very nice man named French O'Tone. The Junior League Polo Benefit. Nearby are screen stars Barbara Stanwyck, French O'Tone, and Joan Crawford. Joan starts things going. The r romance and marriage to French O'Tone was not a career move because uh, she was a much bigger star than he was. In fact, she helped his career by having him co-star with her. He did an awful lot of things for Joan. He uh, taught her, uh, in fact, he wanted her to go on the stage with him. He was well-educated. He was a son of a rich family. He was associated with the group theater in New York. He thought she would be marvelous on the stage. Uh, she had stage fright. She could have never worked on the stage. I remember Francis Tones saying to somebody, part of the reason that their marriage broke up was that he just ran out of adjectives. Every time she came down and they were going out somewhere, she was dressed to the nines. And he had to exalt her and say how gorgeous she looked, and how perfectly groomed she was, and what a great dress, and her hair was beautiful, and so forth. He just got tired of that. Joan uh, Crawford loved going to New York. She loved seeing plays. And when she'd see a play that she felt was right for her, she went to the head of MGM, Irving Thalberg, and she would tell him that she'd love to do this particular play. And uh, before she knew it, Irving Thalberg's wife, Norma Shearer, would be doing the part. Actually, she had more success in films, particularly in the late 30s, than did Shearer. And so they realized what a box office champion they had. And they gave her great co-stars, Gable, Tracy. She was always combined with top stars, and that's the best and easiest way to really build a career. The importance of the women is that it was the first true villain that Crawford was to play. 
About time he found out I was a home girl. Home girl? <laughs> Get her. Why don't you borrow the quintuplets for these? Because I'm all the baby he wants, pet. She wanted to play this role very badly. It was an all-star MGM production. Everybody on the studio was in it, as long as they were female. <laughs> Good grip on yourself, you're going to die. Stephen Haynes is stepping out on Mary. L'amour, l'amour. That's French for love. You should have licked that girl where she licked you. In his arms. Stephen's fed up with the crystal in your heart, you know it. Yes, take my advice, because you put your mind on your alimony. Alimony? With what Stephen can get on you, he won't have to give you a dime. Here at last in The Women, she had equal co-starring billing with her number one arch-rival, Norma Shearer. Had two years to grow claws, Mother. Jungle Red! She was married to the boss, and I was just an actress. She didn't like my dress. So she changed it 19 times. It cost the picture a fortune. <laughs> but I ended up wearing the gold dress and turban. You're very confident, aren't you? Yes, because I know Stephen couldn't love a girl like you. Well, if he couldn't, he's an awfully good actor. She was very, very nice to the crew. Always generous to everybody. Every now and then she would come across somebody that she didn't like. And her anger and her wrath, just as extravagant as she could be in her praise, she could also be in her criticism if she didn't like something. She was a perfectionist. And I don't think she was ever pleased with anything she ever did. When she did a woman's face, one whole side of her face was disfigured. Did she? Yes, and now just watch the... There we are. Is that better? She felt that if it was a good part, that was the important thing. The picture was the important thing. You couldn't marry me. Have I asked you to marry me? Well, no. And you mustn't. Why not? Because I want to get married. I've always wanted to get married. I want to have a home and children. I want to go to market and cheat the grocer and fight with the landlord. I, I want to belong to the human race. I want to belong. She'd had two miscarriages with Douglas, and she had one with Francho. So as a result, she decided to adopt. Christina, she adopted her first. And uh, then she decided she wanted a little boy. So she adopted Christopher. And uh, that, was, that was wonderful for a long, long time. She was a pioneer in this field because she, at that time she was not married. And it was very difficult, if not impossible, for women who were single or divorced uh, to adopt children. When we would go on locations, they would stand and cry and carry on, Mommy, please don't leave us, don't leave us, we, we don't want you to go. And she would try to explain to them that she had to go, this was her job, and she had to go. And uh, they would still beg and cry and carry on. Joan Crawford uh, came to the end of her MGM days in a very traumatic way. Uh, she had done uh, two or three real bad flops. In those years, stars' lives as real top stars didn't last very long, particularly the women. The women have a, a very short shelf life. People wanted to see young actresses and bright youth on the screen. And so Crawford was cast adrift. On her last day at the studio, she said, goodbye to a few old friends and drove out the auto gate and nothing was said no speeches no gold watch no flowers even well i was in good company with um katherine hepburn and fred astaire and a few others um i thought well i'm through 
And then Jerry Wald, who was at Warner Brothers, uh, very active and uh, ambitious producer, uh, persuaded Warner to sign Crawford. And uh, they signed her to a long-term contract, I think for half of what her salary had been at, uh, at Metro. And they submitted various scripts to her, which she turned down. She told me a story once about when she got a call from a producer to come into the studio. And she was very hopeful that they were gonna offer her a new script and a good script. She got all dressed up, bought a new hat. She was hoping that he would compliment her on how she looked. And she said that he, he turned to her and he said, now I think this last script that uh, we sent you is a good script and you should do it because nobody wants you. And uh, if you want to work, you ought to do this picture. And she told me she went home and she cried for, for hours afterward, but she made up her mind she wasn't going to do anything, do any script that they sent her unless she said, they sent her something good. Then finally, the script came for Mildred Pierce. Well, I think God had his hand on my shoulder because Mr. Mike Curtis hated me. He wanted Barbara Stanwyck. He wanted no part of me. He said, I don't want those big, broad shoulders. I asked if I could please test. I did the test with Anne Blythe. At the end of the scene, I waited for cut, cut, cut. Nothing, no response from the director. And I looked at him, his, he was streaming with tears down his face, and he said, I love you, baby. <laughs> I got the part. Mildred. Mildred. A name gasped in the night. You make me feel, oh, I don't know, warm. And wanted. The result was a very successful picture in which she won the Academy Award, something that she had been hoping for for a long time. You've been snooping around ever since I got this job trying to find out what it is. And now you know. You know, don't you? Know what? Know what, Mother? You knew when you gave that uniform to Lottie that it was mine, didn't you? Your uniform? Yes, I'm waiting tables in a downtown restaurant. My mother, a waitress. I took the only job I could get so you and your sister could eat and have a place to sleep and some clothes on your backs. Aren't the pies bad enough? Did you have to degrade us? Peter, don't talk like that. I'm really not surprised. You've never spoken of your people, who you came from, so perhaps it's natural. Maybe that's why father... <gasps> oh, I'm sorry I did that. I'd have rather cut off my hand. I'd never have taken the job if I hadn't wanted to keep us all together. I don't think the public knows what that Oscar means to us. It is one of the most emotional things that can ever happen to a human being. They changed her contract at Warner's. After the rewrite of the contract, she told me she was getting $250,000 a picture, which was an enormous amount of money back in the 40s. She wanted anything that was a good picture. Jerry Wall didn't want her to do humoresque because he said, Joan, you're only in the last part of the picture. She said, I don't care. If it's a good picture, she says, and I can play, and I, I'll play Wally Berry's grandmother. You don't expect me to believe that, do you? I don't care what you believe. I'd like to slap your face. Why don't you try it? Most audiences have the wrong impression of Crawford. She always portrayed a very strong, willful, willful woman. She was not that in real life. That was performance, that was acting. She was anything but. That might have been the dichotomy about Joan Crawford, that she was very headstrong and ambitious, almost um, maniacally ambitious. And yet she was very vulnerable. She wanted to be liked. After the uh, breakup of the marriage with Tone, she felt that the uh, home needed a father and the children needed a father. 
and she met Philip Terry, who was under contract to MGM, and she felt very comfortable with him. But years later, after she divorced him, she said she made a mistake, and she, th she thought being comfortable was, was love, but it wasn't. We were in Sedona, Arizona, and uh, we were working out in 120 degree heat. By that time, she had adopted twins, too, so she had four children to talk with. She would listen to all the problems, and finally she'd say, now you keep a happy face and you know that mommy loves you and I'll call you tomorrow night. Now put your sister on. This went on for all four of these children and then she just collapsed afterwards. And I said to her two or three nights later, I said, Joan, how can you do this every night? She said, well, they're children. If I didn't, they wouldn't understand. She loved those children. And I think she was a devoted mother. I don't think anybody will truly understand uh, Joan's relationship to her children, why she adopted them. I think she felt as a woman that she wouldn't be fulfilled if she didn't have children. Joan was a, a real taskmaster, primarily with herself, and it did reflect onto other people. She was a rigid mother very rigid, and she was rigid with the children. She was a disciplinarian. She, uh, she wanted us to grow up um, independently, um, self-reliant, and to set our goals to what we believe is, was right. She was determined not to let her kids fall into that kind of princess, prince, Hollywood, uh, syndrome that uh, sadly a lot of famous actors children had fallen into. Uh, she felt that these children might not have the money to live the kind of life that she lived and she wanted them to be able to go out and face the world. We had one cook and we had our, our governess but we still had to make our beds and wash our dishes and I think uh, we were told when we were about four or five years old, we had to bring our chairs into the kitchen sink and, and start washing the dishes. And of course the children resented that because they felt that the servants were there to do that. And she knew that was wrong. And all she was doing was just preparing them to go out into the world. I saw her mostly when she was with the twins. and. Uh... I also saw the way she talked about them, and she would talk about the twins with a different tone than she talked about Christine or Christopher. I do know she was frustrated with uh, Christopher. Joan and I had driven down to visit her son, who was in a uh, military boarding school, and I know he hadn't been writing home because he just didn't want to. So I told him I felt I didn't write to my mother enough, and I thought it'd be nice if he did, and I think he did once or twice. I was assigned as a costumer on uh, Flamingo Road. I was so thrilled about meeting her, I wondered how she would react to somebody that was a fan, really. I walked in and I said, uh, I'm here to be, help you today. She said, welcome aboard, and which relaxed me immediately. And I, I felt I was so fortunate not only to find her still the glamorous star, but a very warm and wonderful person to work with. I'd heard so many stories about her and I didn't know exactly what to expect. I thought she'd be very demanding, overpowering and overwhelming. And uh, what I saw and which surprised me was a woman who seemed very much down to earth, very simple, unpretentious, um, and, and, uh, and very smart insofar as films were concerned. You could see the, the signs of age beginning to creep up. But of course, when she got made up, she looked wonderfully in it. She was very, very nice to the crew, always generous to everybody. One instance where she misbehaved. When we were doing a picture called Goodbye My Fancy, it was the last film I did with her, there was a young girl in it named Janice Rule. Because she was a beginner, I was trying to help her, and I spent maybe a little more time than normal talking with her and trying to make her comfortable and getting her into the role. And Joan, for no reason at all, became very jealous. I think for one thing, 
uh, Janice was very young and very pretty, and uh, she was very rude to, uh, to Janice. And years later, when Janice Rule became a very good actress, Crawford sent her a letter apologizing for the way she had treated her. I have no place in your life, Myra, no proper place. Without you, I have nothing. When Joan uh, was cast in Sudden Fear, it was a demanding role that she needed in her career. <laughs> One of the actresses that she worked with was Gloria Graham. And unlike most actresses, she liked Gloria Graham and was great help to her. I worked with Gloria Graham, and Gloria Graham told me that a lot of her performance was guided by Crawford. Try to stand on it. It's the best thing. No, I don't think you should. Exercise is good for it. Is it? Keeps the circulation going. All right, Irene. Joan Crawford was an actress of many different colors. Each role was a step towards something better. She became the character, which many people don't do. She was good with people. People were in awe of her, and she was never in awe of herself. She was willing to walk up to anybody, shake hands with them, talk with them. Who are you? What's your name? She was always sending notes, always sending notes or telegrams every time on my birthday at Christmas time. The fan letters were uh, answered in her own handwriting. She sent out thousands of photographs, hand autographs. She said to me, never go out. You must never go out dressed like sometimes you dress. You must always look your best for your fans. You never know who you're going to see. What made her a star was I worked my buns off to get here and I'm not going to lose it. And so therefore, if it meant getting dressed up to go to the market, she'd do it. If it meant giving one more interview to somebody you can't stand, but it's gonna help the picture, she would do it. She didn't complain. She was a total pro. Hollywood, it's given me my education. It's given me everything I've ever earned. The power to adopt children, to raise them, to educate them. I will never be ungrateful for that. I had finished working with Joan and Johnny Guitar, and I was doing a picture called The Rose Tattoo. I was being interviewed by a, one of the movie magazines. One of the writers came in and said to the editor, oh, you wanted me to do a story on Joan Crawford? He said, oh, yeah, that's right. Okay, good. Get at it. He said, well, what do you want, good girl or a bitch? And he said, um, make her a bitch. I said, Joan, how do you handle that when people do that? And she said, oh, darling, suppose they never wrote about me at all. I thought, hmm, she could have been a politician. Any man's my man if I want it that way. Not Judd. Ask him. No, I won't ask him. I won't go to him with your lies. I wouldn't lie to you about something as important as this. I love playing bitches, and I was a bitch in that. Who do you think? There's a lot of bitch in every woman, and a lot of bitch in every man, too. <laughs> It was my second film. I was a Broadway actor and um, knew very little about movie acting. Had done one picture picnic, returned to New York, and then was called back to do Autumn Lees with uh, opposite Joan Crawford. Since you went away, the days grow long, and soon I'll hear old winter song. Good night. Good night. Bert, please don't come back anymore. Ford. I mean it. Don't come back. Can't Find a girl your own age. Here's that woman that seduced Walter Houston when I was a little kid in La Jolla. 
She was a very directive person and very well organized. And, uh, and a damn good actress. You conniving tramp. Now that'll teach you. No more lies. I saw all three of you through the door. She my... was able to summon up some very real emotions. She turned to Charles Lang, who was our DP, our director of photography. And, Charlie, uh, you want tears? Uh, maybe one eye? She could drop a tear out of the left eye or the right eye, or both eyes. I mean, that I'd, I'd work with Helen Hayes and other famous women, but I'd never seen that before. If you have a very sad beginning, uh, if you've had a sad life, that's something that actors use very, very often to summon up uh, an emotion when uh, whatever happened to you that broke your heart, if you can recall that, you can summon up those tears. So I think underneath that very fierce, determined, individualistic, strong Joan was a very sad little girl. The last picture I worked with her on was uh, Esther Costello, because she had married Alfred Steele, who was chairman of the board of Pepsi-Cola. She found true, strong, happiness and a sense of security with him that she never found with anybody else because he wasn't a movie star he wasn't worried about how he looked and he wasn't vying for somebody else's part and he wasn't trying to get the limelight away from her totally secure in his position in life as she wanted to be in hers but was not always when mother married al Steele, he would go open um, pepsi plants all over the united states and europe we first went to Switzerland, and we were there twice on our Christmas vacations, one with uh, all four of us kids, and we went to Samaritz. We uh, learned to ice skate. When Al Steele was CEO, Joan attended meetings, and eventually they pointed her to the board. It got her accustomed to speaking to people, to being on a stage, she was terrified at the very beginning, but fell into the routine of doing it. I was just starting my third movie, Best of Everything, and Joan Crawford was signed to uh, play the head of the publishing house. And uh, it was unfortunate that she had, um, that I met her with her at, at, maybe I consider her weakest point in life, her most vulnerable, her most frail. Um, she had just lost Alfred Steele, who was the, uh, she said, at some point, the love of her life. When she would be called to go before the camera, she was scared to death. A couple of times she caught my eye before the take, and I remember just going, you know, you know, you can do it. I think that gave her confidence, certainly when she, when she got it right on camera and had the momentum going and knew her words and knew what she was doing, there was no question that you could see everything that made Joan Crawford a star. There's something about long-lasting female stars that uh, is kind of peculiar and, and interesting in that they have kept their position by being strong women, strong-willed. Here were the two most famous grand dames of cinema history. And the poor Bob Aldrich, who was the director, but was more like a lion tamer. Oh, Blanche. You know we got rats in the cellar? started to shoot whatever happened to baby Jane. 
and Davis came out in that white makeup, Joan was shocked. She couldn't believe what she was looking at. Davis was very nasty to her, and I was there to witness it, very short with Joan. And Joan was not a fighter. She just did not know how to fight back. And who could fight back with Davis? She had words at her command that Joan could not fathom. Then it seemed retribution was at hand. Davis had Joan tied in the bed. Davis had to pull Joan out of the bed. Whereupon Davis said to Joan, be very careful now when you get off that bed because I have a bad back. She says, so don't become a dead weight for me. You can almost see the light bulb going on over Joan's head. But she had an idea. So as Davis pulled her out of the bed, Joan became a dead weight. They both fell on the floor. Joan fell on top of Davis. And all you could hear was Davis screaming and swearing. Davis was out for a few days. She, her back was injured. And Joan got up and practically brushed off her hands and walked off the set. The movie set was still her home. Uh, she had no other life uh, until she married Al Steele and became Mrs. Pepsi-Cola. I sold Joan Crawford for so long, all I have to do now is let Joan Crawford sell Pepsi-Cola. She wanted to extend her career as long as possible, even taking these quickie pictures which were in and out of theaters in a week or so. She always wanted to please, and she would gauge the public's taste as to what they wanted at a particular time, and she would change like a chameleon. In the 20s, Joan was the flapper, the jazz baby. And in the 30s, uh, the Depression era demanded a new type of heroine to be accepted by the audiences, and that was the woman struggling through the hardships of the Depression. In the 40s, she was, she was now getting older. She wasn't the young girl coming up the hard way. She was the woman who already came up, who already was established. In the 50s, now she was a much more mature actress. In Autumn Leaves, in love with Cliff Robertson, much younger than her. Romanced and victimized by Jack Palance in Sudden Fear. Also, the age difference, a crucial plot point. In the next decade, in the 60s, she began doing the horror films. Joan Crawford's unique achievement? Well, how about the fact that she was a working actress, that she was an entertainer? She always gave 110% in everything that she ever did. There is never a case of you finding a piece of film with, with Joan Crawford slumming. If you can pull a piece of film out of the vault that's 60 years old and still be dazzled by the vibrancy of the persona and still be entertained by the performance, I don't think she ever expected to give quite that much. Joan Crawford was a very proud woman. So when Sickness did come upon her. Uh, she was aging. She could no longer look her best. Uh, it was sort of like the legend of the elephants who go away to die. So she holed up in her apartment in New York and just pulled down the curtain. You'd say, Joan, come and have dinner. Oh, my darling, I love to, but I can't. I know she gave away her little dog. She let her faithful old Mama Sita, the maid, go. She seemed to be clearing up her life. Sad to say, she died alone. Crawford is one of those images that's been tarnished. I really wasn't surprised when Christina came out with that dreary, vicious book of hers, Mommy Dearest. These things just didn't happen. 
she had a wonderful secretary by the name of Betty Barker. Betty was with her for 27, 28 years. And Betty said, I must have been living in another home. I never saw this happen. The twins said the same thing. And she wasn't that kind of person that my sister Christina had said. She was very caring and loving. I think Christine was very, very envious of Joan Crawford and her public and her popularity and her beauty. Very envious. Joan called me on many occasions to help Christine get a job as an actress, which I did on two occasions. Joan did everything possible for that child. She wanted to be an actress. She wanted to be Joan Crawford. I've never seen um, mother lose her cool. She never lost her cool in front of us. I think sometimes she showed her frustration, but not in the cruelty that um, the book had mentioned. Um, she was a fine woman. She had two fine careers, one in um, an actress and one as a businesswoman, and she never lost control. The producer was visiting Joan in her apartment in New York. And he noticed that there was a little man in a wheelchair there, very aged and uh, infirm and white-haired. Uh, she never introduced him until she went to the door with him and said uh, to this producer, uh, well, thank you for coming by. And, and the producer said, who is that? And he said, well, she said, well, that's Francho. Here at the end of both their lives, she had taken in her old husband from 30, 40 years before, was serving him up dinner and trying to cheer him up. And that was a, another side that most people don't hear about Joan. Joan's whole life was, was work hard and be better. Try, be your best, be your best, whatever that was. There may never have been enough security that allowed her to be who she really was, but I applaud her strength, I really do. I remember her coming out of the club on 52nd Street. Her limousine didn't arrive. She'd always have a small pocket of fans. The doorman said, well, Miss Crawford, should I get you a cab? Yes, she said. The cab arrived, she got in the cab, and the first thing she did after the door closed was she turned on the light inside the cab. And then she said to the driver, so that her fans could see almost like the queen in a carriage going off with the light on in the back. She loved the light. She loved the attention. Ladies and gentlemen, Miss Joan Crawford. I never knew there was so much love. <laughs>